HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Oh, that's a cheer we used to do in softball. Uh, what? It's uh, actually Geico. Whenever someone hit a triple, we would wave our bats and yell, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. But we never got to use it because we would only hit home runs. Annoying. The phrase is from Geico because they help save people money. Geico? Yeah, they were our team sponsor. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. We really are really grateful um, in this time of gratitude, um, you know, as we head into the end of the year, um, that this podcast is really gaining a lot of recognition as a great resource for small business owners, entrepreneurs, and salespeople. From Inc.com to MSNBC's Your Business to Proven to Fit Small Business, uh, this podcast has um, been added to lists of the best podcasts to listen to uh, for business. Um, in, in a couple of different categories. So we're really thrilled about that. Um, and we know it's because of the guests that, that come on here. You know, these are folks who have expertise in various areas of business. They give their time and their knowledge uh, for all of you so that you can take what you need and do better things in your business. Uh, today, we have such a person with us. We have Kurt Steinhorst with us. Kurt is on a mission to rescue us from our distracted selves. So put down your cell phone and listen to the rest of this. Having spent years studying the impact of tech on human behavior, Kurt founded FocusWise, a consultancy that equips organizations to overcome the distinct challenges of the constantly connected workplace. He is a leading voice on strategic communication speaking more than 75 times a year to everyone from global leadership associations and nonprofits to Fortune 100 companies. Kurt is the author of the book, 
Can I have your attention? Inspiring better work habits, focusing your team, and getting stuff done in the constantly connected workplace. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kurt. I'm excited to be here, Diane. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you on here. This is a subject that, you know, does not get enough attention, <laughs> especially <laughs> in today's environment. Um, so, so let's like dive right into it. Let's talk yeah. about distraction in the workplace. Um, you've done a lot of research, as I had said, and based on that research, what trends are you finding? Well, we're, we're living in the evidence of and the results of, a, of an endlessly accessible, no barriers to connectivity world. And what that means practically for people at work is that we've never received more uh, communication flow on a single day. People are having to respond or send uh, 215 emails a day. And what's ironic is even the messaging systems that are supposed to solve that actually aren't reducing the volume of emails. So the volume's higher, we've never been more connected, but there's a consequence and that's that we've never been more interrupted. So people are only working a couple minutes at a time before having their attention redirected to something else that is supposedly urgent and immediate. And uh, so at its core, we are seeing this shift uh, in the way that endless access creates uh, this one dearth of uh, a resource, which is our attention. We have more coming at us, and yet we um, have less resources to manage that than ever. Yeah, boy, that's so interesting. It, it, what's so weird for me about that is um, when I think about distractions, you said something that I, just so hit me that um, it's that we're not able to work consistently that you know that it's not just that it's a distraction it's the interruption of it and that we can that we're, we have difficulty gaining traction on anything because because of the distractions yeah and and there's several different sources for it but people feel the impact of what interrupts them but they also demand the immediate response of the things that they want and so we have on the one hand that we are uh, we have more within our immediate reach than ever but we're also more immediately really reachable and so any attempt to focus and get the most important stuff done is then um, has to has to then uh, battle with people's expectations for us that we would somehow always be available and responsive yeah wow so what is this doing to companies bottom line <laughs> well, and, you know, one of the things that in our research leading up to the book that we found is that there's some ways that we can quantify it and uh, we can quantify it by looking at literally walking into an organization and seeing how people are working and, and seeing just how often they're flipping between screens and how often they're replying. We, we uh, typically respond to any message we receive or we look at it within six seconds of receipt and we can see it that way. And in that sense, the flipping back and forth, there's a 40% drop in our efficiency. So we can already say we're slower than we would be if we were doing one thing at a time. Uh, we can, wow. but then there's this indefinable way uh, that we have to be aware, which is the quality of our work goes down when we're flipping back and forth. There's a reorienting cost. And so uh, one, we're losing time, getting less done while feeling overwhelmed, but even more, the quality of what we're doing is actually decreasing. So attempts to make some sort of a quantifiable cost on the bottom line can look as high as some estimates of a half a billion, or excuse me, half trillion dollars on the US economy. Uh, depending on the industry, we're talking between two and four hours a day lost to uh, varying forms of social, uh, social interruptions, like the busiest hours of Facebook are between one and 3 p.m and the 60% of online retail purchases, which the timing makes sense, are done during working hours. So we're seeing <laughs> time costs, we're seeing quality costs, and we're seeing financial costs. Wow. Oh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's tough. We're gonna have to talk about good news because yeah. this is awful. <laughs> You know, th what's funny about it, though, is I think it's, we kind of all feel it. Most of us underestimate yeah. how much it's costing us. And most of us are, if we, if we, uh, if we're to ask them how often they're interrupted or how often they find themselves glancing at Facebook or social media, even though 87% of people do, uh, we would typically underestimate it. But I, I think one of the important 
reminders that we have is that we're really in a situation no one's ever been in. Like, yeah. no one's supposed to have to choose a spreadsheet when we have Netflix available. <laughs> like, no one should have to make that choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the, there's some real benefits as well. Yeah, it's really nice that I can go home and leave work earlier, hang out with my kids, and then answer a quick phone call or respond to an email rather than having to be at work longer. So, there's some real benefits uh, when we, and, and one, there's real benefits, and two, we also need to not feel like we're terrible humans when we struggle to work. No one was supposed to have to deal with this. Wow, I think that is really a good point, and I I have found in my business, being a solopreneur, working from home, that I, that because there are so many hours in the day, I had to really, you know, like shrink it back and go, okay, wait, you have to work during these hours and then break because having all this time available to me and sort of leaning into the, letting the distractions be there actually created a situation where I wasn't getting things done because I felt like I had all this time to get them done. It was this weird, you know, sort of backwards thing that, yeah. that it just doesn't work. You know, it's just we totally. need structure. Yeah, and it, there's several layers to that, but the short and simple, I will tell businesses all the time, um, always available means never fully available. We never feel yeah. guilty checking in on social media in the middle of the day when we feel like we have to be there at 10 p.m. to reply to someone. And so we end up doing this half in, half out where literally no phase of our life, no sphere of our life gets as much of us and we're always partially in, partially out. And, you know, the truth is that it would be total lunacy for us to say nine to five, I don't reply to home stuff. I only get work done and then I go home. And so like yeah. those types of outdated ideas ignore the benefits of our connectivity. On the other hand, when we, when we aren't intentional about knowing what demands our full attention and what to the point that we have to filter out access to other things, when we don't set aside specific space and time for us to do one thing, like the most critical parts of every sphere of our life, then what we end up doing is never really giving anything what it deserves. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is really a key point. I, I really do. That's that's really it. It hopefully helps people to sort of reframe um, how they look at all of this. Because yeah. you're right. It, you know, it, it's 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 a weird world. It's definitely a weird world. We have so many not just distractions, but new ways of communicating with each other, and it's just really sort of turned things upside down for people. I think we're still trying to figure out how we adjust to it in a way that works for, you know, for our business, for our lives, for everything. Totally. And, you know, I always ask people really simply, like, what are the things in your day that are so critical that it's not worth the quality or time loss for you to get them done, that it's actually more important to not be available and than it is to be available. And the truth is there aren't many of those things. You know, there, there's only a few things yeah. that, that when we think about a lot of our work is just replying to people. It is setting a calendar appointment. It is, you know, doing an expense report, but there are a few things that, that if we don't give them our full attention, if we don't say, Hey, for 40 minutes, I'm going to block off access. I'm going to nail this. I'm going to get this done. We end up like putting it off to the last minute. We end up, um, turning something in that no one knows, but we know we didn't give our best to. And then we go home and we do the same thing. Like we, we go home and our family, you know, people spend 60% more time connected to digital than they do in conversation with their significant other. And we wonder why a few years later that we're struggling and not feeling connected. Well, hey, you know, enjoy YouTube, enjoy Netflix, enjoy responding on Instagram and Twitter, but hey, set 30 minutes aside at dinner that you actually are going to have a real conversation. Yeah. So why are we so addicted to our phones? Well, this one's, uh, you're, <laughs> the, <laughs> there are many, many layers uh, to this. I'll give you a couple. Uh, okay. Actually, I'll be even simpler. Fundamentally, our devices offer us access to the infinite. They offer us, um, they offer us the potential of something exciting that our brain was not meant to resist. 
And uh, I tell people often, most of the time where you are isn't the coolest place you could be. You know, people are always frustrated. Everyone's on their phone. Well, when I'm walking through an airport, honestly, it would be much more fun to be hanging out with friends. And so why not go on Instagram and look at what they're up to? You know, so let's be honest. Now there's, yeah. there's, there's this layer here around the, the neuroscience and what's taking place with technology companies, which is true. So I'll give you a couple layers. One is it, it's called an associated reward based on what um, BF Skinner, a, a psychologist, one of the uh, most renowned psychologists of the early 20th century talked about being what we call intermittent reinforcement. And uh, they had rats in a cage and anytime they wanted food, they could hit a lever, the food would come out. And that group, anytime they needed food, anytime they were hungry, that's what they would do. But then they would go and do other things. Another group, uh, whenever they hit the lever, sometimes food would come out, sometimes it wouldn't, and they didn't know when, there was no pattern. And that group spent the entire day, all night, all day, just hitting the lever over and over again. Uh, it's when we don't actually know if the reward's gonna be there that the anticipation and possibility increases the connection. It's the slot machine effect. So at some point you got a really fun message from someone you didn't expect on your phone, and your brain said, this is, this is important. This is good for survival. This I want to do again. I want more of this. Your brain wants more of it. And so now it doesn't even have to be there. Most of the time it's, you know, a, it's, you know, a, a spam from AT&T, but occasionally <laughs> it's really exciting. And it's the fact that it could be that next that creates this reward that you want to run back to. Um, now I, I will say one of the issues that I find today that's interesting in the conversations I'm in with on the research side is that you know, I truly could tell you 10 different things Netflix or Netflix, LinkedIn, Facebook are doing to make you want to spend more time and attention on them. The truth is what they're doing is they're creating products we want more. And we can either, you know, spend a lot of time being victims and saying these companies are making it where we're, uh, <laughs> it's their fault, but that's the world we live in. And so I tend to say, uh, let's just, let's just say it is what it is and make decisions and decide we're not going to be victims. Like we can choose to own the technology rather than having it own us. Like that's a choice we yeah. can make. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's make some good choices. So th this is like a perfect segue for me because, um, your company is called focus wise. You have a con a, you know, this concept called fo focus wise. So, which I'm pretty sure has to do with teaching us how to really focus. So what <laughs> is, you know, what does focus wise mean? Great question. The really, really simple three things that we use to, to really define whether we're being wise in the decisions we're making towards what we pay attention to. And the first one is the capacity to focus on what's important when the trivial is alluring and available. Uh, the second one is much like I mentioned earlier that we, uh, the, the, the technology would, serve us rather than us serving it, our relationship with technology. Uh, we get the benefits without the costs. And then the third one is that we would be active in our ability to reduce costly distractions, costly interruptions uh, in a world where people expect your instant and immediate availability. So that's what it looks like. And, and ultimately, the reason we say, we, we, we talk about it being focus wise is because it's really easy in these conversations to, you know, set a standard that sounds good. Future self wants to do one thing at a time. Future, my future self never wants to check my phone while watching a TV show, even though 90% of us do. My future self wants to ignore the ping, doesn't want to go on social media. It, but, but my present self really likes all those things. And so it's not about having an like unrealistic, perfect standard. It's about um, moving a direction towards control of this valuable resource that is our focus and is our attention, that knows our limits, knows what it means to not be able to focus all the time, but also can put the most important resources or the, the most important work towards that, those full fo focus activities. Okay, so give me an idea of what like some of the actions would be at work yep. to become, you know, become more focused. Totally. Uh, so there's a, f there's a bunch of ways we could go, but I think the easiest is to just look, there's, there's four factors that shape whether we're good at focusing on the right thing or not. Uh, and, you know, one of them is our energy. 
basically every time you choose to focus, you know, your brain's not made to focus, it's made to be distracted, but we can, we can overcome that, but it's uh, very limited and it takes a lot of energy resources in our brain. And so uh, really short and simple is how much sleep are we getting? How much, how are we eating? These things can push us to more focus or actually rob us of focus, but even more like, can we structure our day so that we do the more intense focus activities like that proposal is really hard when I was working on the book that's way harder than replying to emails I want to structure my day so that the harder stuff is first and earlier when I have more resources so that's like a really easy strategy give myself the afternoon to be interrupted uh, when I want the nap but in the morning that's when I'm going to knock out those two or three things that are really important um, that's energy and then the next one is our environment uh, this is really basic. What you see, what you hear, the sights, sounds that you hear are either facilitating focus or distraction. So how do I make sure that when I look at my screen, I, go, I don't have 12 tabs open, I don't have email pinging me, I don't flip between 16 different things, but I try to shrink my environment virtually so that I have one thing in front of my screen. Um, I move from having my inbox as my home screen to having my calendar that I've, I've proactively dictated. So I want, I want to set my day based on what the biggest important priorities are given space for the other stuff rather than letting my inbox dictate what I look at next. Right. Um, yeah. I'm so with those, you. Yeah. So those are a couple, the, the other two I'll be real fast with experience our past choices shape how well we focus in the future. So, you know, I, I love fantasy football. I'm not going to look at fantasy football at the desk that I'm writing my book on. I'm going to look at it somewhere else because otherwise what happens is every time I sit down at that same spot, I find myself wanting to look at fantasy football. So yeah. I pick a place where we do specific types of work um, and then we do the rest of the work elsewhere. And then the last one is our emotion. And, and our emotion is interesting because uh, one of the best ways that you can make yourself get more work done is by giving yourself a break to watch something funny. That funny cat video, great for focus. Five minutes of distraction making you feel better, the more um, happy our emotional state is, the more we'll be able to extend our focus. The worse our emotional state, the more we're gonna have to, we're gonna do whatever we can to make ourselves feel better, which incidentally is that same funny cat video. <laughs> now that's ironic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what, the cat video always works. That's oh, right. Without a head. The central place. <laughs> yep. Wow. I, it's so interesting because it really does sound, uh, I'll say simple, right? Like when yeah. you say, just, you know, don't do that thing at the same place you do the other thing. Boy, I, it just, I, I get it. I wouldn't have thought of it. It never would have come into my head as that that was a thing. But you say it and I go, yeah, I totally get that. And I can even picture that in my world. You know, when I sit in my office, I am a hundred times more productive than anywhere else within my house. Yep. Now, I can go to a coffee shop. I, I can sometimes be equally focused, but there's something about where I am and whether there are other distractions around. It's really, this is interesting. Totally. And it's probably part of the reason that only 7% of people say they do their best work in an office because you have an right. open office where everyone, you're friends with, you know, every person you can see while you're supposed to be working increases the likelihood you're not going to get your work done. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then what's interesting is you enter into these corporate uh, organizations that have open office, but they provide quote unquote private space, which culturally means you're not doing your work because you're on a personal phone call. So no one uses it. And then they wonder why everyone's spending their whole day talking, but never actually right. have any space to work. So people leave to be able to get it done. Right. Which is, you know, wow. a complicated and expensive uh, waste of <laughs> office space. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sounded like a good idea at the time. Not so much. Totally. Wow. wow. All right. I got to take a quick sponsor break. And before I do, I have to ask you the question. Is your book on Audible? <laughs> I love Audible. I'm an Audible subscriber. It is currently in process, but has not come out yet. Okay. Okay. Well, when it does, you'll let me know and I'll start adding it into the For sure. um, sponsor break. Okay. Uh, Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. 
They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. If you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall and The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today, we're talking with Kurt Steinhorst about how to overcome all the distractions we are confronted with. So, Kurt, before we took the sponsor break, we were talking about these workplaces and these offices and, and how oftentimes they don't work. So what is an ideal focus-wise workspace? Well, it, it, in a lot of ways, it depends on the type of work you're doing. But okay. uh, at the highest level, what we're big advocates for is matching the type of environment to the type of task. So I'm actually a big fan of moving around at work. Uh, and there's a lot of research that would say that um, like moving locations increases retention and increases your ability to think. Uh, so moving around is a good thing. Uh, what I would say is the, those particular tasks that you need to not be available for, we want a place where people can't easily access you. So that's, we call that our focus fault, but that's basically the cube with a sign on the door that says, you know, I hate you or whatever it is, like some visual physical <laughs> element that shows we don't work. And then if we have collaborative time or we have email that we have to knock out a bunch of things quickly, if it's relatively mind numbing, that's when we move to more open, fun environments. And then the last thing is you definitely want to have places where you're, you can be in motion. Uh, it's amazing. Like no one wants to work from one to 3 PM. So we look at Facebook, but really if we would just take that meeting from the, from a conference call and move that meeting or from the like terrible boardroom that no one wants to be in. And we just go on a short walk and talk about it. Our thinking would go up and it would restore yeah. us so we could get some more work done later in the day. Wow. That's a really good point. It's true. People, adults especially, have to get up and move around and get more oxygen to their brains. And um, yeah. so that, that really, that, that, that's sort of a double whammy sort of thing. Yeah, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that I run into over and over again is people feel guilty that they can't focus. They feel like they're distracted, but they don't realize that the solution isn't to just gut it out. The solution is to be aware of how your brain works and do the yeah. things that make it easier to focus. You know, hey, you can't focus all day, but if you sit at your same desk all day, never move, and then feel frustrated that you're looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, you're replying to emails while you're not, well, change it up. Like, only spend 30 minutes there, then go somewhere else yeah. to have a conversation, right? Yep. Okay, so a second ago, you said something about a vault, and then mm -hmm. you moved on, but I want to come back to it. Talk some more about that. What is that? And why is it important? And how can a company use it effectively? Yeah, this is one of the things that, that uh, organizations, we spend a lot of time working with organizations to institute. My, as an aside, my, my grandfather never had to go to a gym his whole life. He never had to, but he was in great shape because he just worked. <laughs> and that's what work looked like for him. He was in motion, lifting yeah. things. We go to gyms because we need a, a distinct place to work our physical bodies since the world we live in doesn't do it. Um, the truth is there's nothing about a gym that we should pay for. We could we do all of it anywhere we are. But the distinctive component, like I'm going to go here to do an activity I otherwise wouldn't want to do, is what I'm talking about. And so when it comes to how we think about creating that type of environment for our own focus resources, that's really what a vault is. And, and the practicals of a vault are, it's a place we go for a limited period of time. Like it's, it's not something we spend all day in. We do, I do two 40 minute sessions a day. I use technology to fight technology where I literally turn off my access to the internet and use an app called Freedom, which is awesome. And I have had a conversation with people that know I'm not available. 
so internet's not accessible. My, wi my wife knows I go to do not disturb. People don't get in touch with me. So I turn off and set high barriers for a short period of time. And it's in those moments that I first, I prioritize. That's how I start, like what is most important. And then I dive into whatever that one to three things that I need to do today in order to define it as a successful day. And, and the vault is a just, it's a single place that we do only those things. Okay. I love this idea. And I, the thought that keeps coming into my head is I really hope the listeners are hearing this because I find that a lot of people I interact with feel like they can't do that. Yep. Like it's that thing you said about people having an expectation that you're going to be responsive. They've, they've created their own monster yep. by being responsive all the time. And then they feel like either it's rude to shut their door and put up a do not disturb or whatever, you know, they just, totally they don't they, get the importance of it so keep, yeah i mean I, you know let's reinforce that because that's a really big thing well and and what you're hinting at is a is a important related point which is that focus doesn't happen in a vacuum and neither does distraction and um what happens is we create a culture where primarily our expectations are for people to um, be responsive in fact we i say we have we we've created a world where responsiveness is a synonym for responsibility when in fact it's replaced it. We've ignored our real responsibilities to be responsive. And so um, first thing I always tell people to do is you, you, you need to make a list of the two to five people in your life that have the most um, rightful demands on your availability. And, uh, and you need to set up a conversation to do something that no one does. We communicate about everything except for, expectations around communication. And so <laughs> I hear, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Like people will say, well, my boss expects me to be available all the time. Okay. Well, does your boss also expect you to do bad work because they need right. to know the trade-off. And so, right. you know, often bosses, what you can say to them is, Hey, I want to be responsive, but when, when, when is it okay for me not to be available so I can like knock out the stuff that's most important to you. And so I can also be more present at home. Like it's amazing. Just that short conversation, you're going to turn one of your biggest sources of uh, distraction into your most uh, biggest advocate of focus and actually even an accountability person for you. Um, yeah. and, and the thing, same thing goes with home. You know, I, uh, it's unbelievable that this is the first time in history that people think that it's unreasonable that our, our significant other wouldn't be available to us all day long. But what they also then get frustrated with is we get home and we don't give them much at all. So the conversation we had was with, with my wife was, Hey, I want you to have more of me during the evening. So you can count on me from the time I walk in the door until the time we put the kids to bed. You can count on me not to be looking at my phone, replying to emails. But on the other hand, during these particular hours at work, I need you to be comfortable with me not being responsive. And what's interesting yeah is it's a win for everyone. We all are happier. Yeah, because you're ha you, you are setting the expectation that no one's wondering or thinking or, you know, making assumptions and thinking the wrong thing At, when everybody knows this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. Yep. It makes perfect sense and frees them up to be able to do their thing at their time. Totally. And it also is kind of, it's a good level setting conversation that helps us all to remind ourselves of what we're really aiming towards. Because what often happens is that when we aren't proactive about these decisions, um, it's amazing. We feel guilty if we don't reply to everyone immediately as soon as the text comes in. But at the same time, the one person, the, the very few people that are actually prioritized lowest are the ones that are sitting in a room with us. And, yeah. and so a good reminder, like, no, those people actually don't need to hear from me now. They don't, they're, they're reaching out doesn't require me to therefore drop yeah. everything. And, 
And sometimes we do. Right. I mean, it's, hey, you know what? Let's reply immediately to this text about, uh, hey, it's Christmas season and, and I want to have the gift I want. I better reply to, I better reply to my family member quick because they're about to buy something. <laughs> but most <laughs> of the time, it's just not enough. It's not actually urgent at all. Exactly. Exactly. We impose that urgency. That's right. Right? And, and I heard someone say once that when someone sends you an email, that's their agenda. Yep. So if you're always you know, quick to respond, you are now focusing on other people's agendas, not yours. Totally. And, and I'll even give you an extra layer. It's, this requires intentional thought. But when we start to, when we reframe the way we think about messages, one of the things that is happening is we get a message and it's a burden. It's like hot potato. And so we want to do, in fact, we're biologically wired to want to do this, is we want to send it off. So we want to like, hey, they replied, how do I get this off my plate? I reply immediately. But the problem is that the faster we reply, the faster it comes back. So all we're doing is speeding up the cycle. <laughs> I awesome. never would have looked at it that way. That is hysterical. Yeah, so just reminding wow. ourselves, hey, sending this message is not going to relieve anything. The only way that I can actually take this off my plate is by not feeling like it, it is actually demanding my attention and urgency. Like, wow. I love that. That is priceless. Okay. So let's talk some about email rules um, to help us stay productive because we're talking about that, you know, that instant replying sort of thing, but what, you know, what should people do with their email? Uh, they should, they should email less. <laughs> they should respond slower. <laughs> this is the easiest way. Uh, in fact, Tony Shea is the founder of Zappos and he didn't reply to any emails the day of. He replies to yesterday's emails or he replies to today's emails to tomorrow. And it's amazing how much gets solved and how many less people message you when you do that. Uh, most of us aren't the CEO of a large company and can't do that. But uh, it's the, the, the higher level point is, is still there. So with that said, here's some really basics that can help. Uh, first, turn off push, turn off the things that ding you and set intervals when you're going to check it. And, and then reply in chunks. So this is like 101. I'm gonna to reply to five emails at the same time. I'm gonna dedicate 20 minutes to it. I'm not gonna to reply to everyone as it comes in. That's the basic, and, but let's go to another level here. Uh, the next one is I don't reply to email. I don't write emails in my email program. I write it, I use Evernote. Getting it out of the inbox, setting a list of who you have to reply to and just replying on a separate, form allows for you to actually have cohesive thought rather than interrupted thought. Um, oh. Another one, I'm just throwing a bunch at you, is yeah. um, how do you move communication off of email, which is a catch-all, and into the channel where the work is being done? So the translation for that is if you have a team and you have project management, so let's say you're using Google Docs. Well, Google Docs, you can comment and reply throughout Google Docs rather than talking about Google Docs in an email. And the, so the work is in the, sh in the sphere that it belongs. Or if you use something like Todoist or Asana, let the project be the place where the communication takes place, not email. Um, then maybe, yeah, my, maybe my favorite one, though, is, is, and this is the one that does require some active thought, is... Um, how do I structure my emails to solve the problem, not just pass it off? Meaning, hey, I'd like to meet with you. Like, let's set up a meeting. Well, how does that normally go? Great meeting you. Would love to have a meeting. Let me know when you're free. Hey, I'm free these days. <laughs> hey, okay, cool. That, that day works good. What time? Great. Do you want to come to me? Do you want me? And you have like 17 emails for one thing. When If you literally could just say, it was great meeting you. As we discussed, I'd love to set up a time. I'm available at the following times. I can call you then or send me your number. Consider it confirmed. And one email can provide everything that now would have typically taken several rounds. Ah, so it's, <clears throat> it's what do you say when you, when you say it? It's what do you, how, how do you approach the subject? That's really interesting. Yeah, save yourself energy by putting a little bit more on the front end. Right. That's interesting. 
I got to tell you, I know a woman who, you know, she's got a scheduling link in her email. And so whenever we have to have a conversation, I just go to her scheduling link and schedule time <laughs> on her calendar. Totally. Now, I will say, yeah. here's a warning on that. Uh, okay. That's a really great idea. It's really, it, it, it is a um, solving of a pain point. But for certain people in certain roles, when you give other people control of your calendar, you've given other people control of your calendar. And so now the meetings are driven largely by who wants your time, not whose time you want. And so that's Ooh. not, you know, it's a great tool for some people. Uh, it's not one I would recommend for a lot. You see this in especially large organizations where meeting volume has gone up because the barrier to scheduling them is lower. And so everyone has access to the vice president's time and they just go on and schedule the meeting. Well, then they wonder why they don't have time to get anything done, you know? Well, yeah, because everyone likes to have meetings, which is the most ridiculous thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, venture in how do we avoid our own responsibilities and let someone else make decisions <laughs> for us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Ugh, it's one of my biggest pet peeves is having meetings. You and me both. I sort of hate them. Um, okay. So are these the methods that you use? <laughs> yeah, to, you know, keep distractions at a minimum. Like, you know, now I, I want, you know, the, the awful truth. Yep. You know, is this what you're doing? Totally. Especially because I have ADD, which is ironic that I study <laughs> out of focus. I often tell people like having someone who has ADD speak on focus is like having Kanye West speak on modesty. <laughs> <laughs> Something ironic. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the answer is yes, within, within reason. I can give you a few things that I'm uh, a Nazi about, and then I can give you a few things that I am uh, – Actually, I'll pause that and say that I probably shouldn't use that word. So, should, oh, uh, <laughs> that's okay. I totally get it. You're really serious about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so a few things that I'm like fully committed to, this is a part of my ritual. And then a few things that are my aims that, you know, I, I that I do better than most statistically, but fight with every day as well. Um, okay. So... Number one, I'm, uh, I have a ritual every evening to eliminate as many decisions for the next morning as possible. So I put the kids to bed or when I'm on the road, I, I pick out my clothes. I, pick, I, I mean, I, I, I lay out every little detail. I'm talking, I use Chemex coffee. I measure out the coffee. I put it in the grinder. I have everything set up, clothes out. Uh, I, I take off the cap of my toothpaste so that... We're talking, there's, there's no way to make the morning more efficient because that's when I have my ability, that's when my ability to get work done is highest. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, then, you know, you jump into work and I do, I, I, I do a warm up lap where I basically look and I say, what are all the emails that have come in? I make a list of them. I uh, align that with the items that are on my to do list. I use an program called Asana. It's not the only one. But then the next thing I do is I, I, I separate all the work, all the things that are on this list into a few categories. The first one is, I call them diamonds. I just use the letter D, diamonds. Like the two to four things that are like, these are going to have to happen. They're important. Then I have dollars, which is, you know, this long list, an $1 bill is not worth a lot, but if you start combining them, they can be. So I do, a, this is the long list of things that I just got to reply to, emails I got to knock out. And then I have, uh, I have what I call dirt. Literally, this is the stuff that has to be on the list because I got to do it eventually, but I've already decided today's not happening. And um, so that's how I start my day. I do that every single day. And depending on whether I'm really focused feeling good or not, I might jump into a few of the easy emails that should be done later, but just to get me warmed up. And then I will, I will, uh, I will dive into that really hard work and, and um, be off to the races. So those are, that, that's really the, that's the most important component of my work, prioritizing and then diving into the hard stuff as early as possible. So, I, I think that's really valuable for people. And, and part of what I heard that I think is really important is knowing, and you said this earlier, is knowing when you 
are most on or, you know, when you work best to get those hard things done and those things that require focus and require attention and a longer uh, span of time and then keeping the distractions away from you during that time, but, you know, and preparing for it. I think what a lot of people do is, I think they do one of two things. I think one is they wake up in the morning and they just face their day and whatever happens, happens. Yep. Then I think there's another group of people who they make their list, but they don't rearrange it like you do. Like they don't say, like I do what you do. I'll say, here are three things that I have to get done this morning. The rest of the day, whatever. But these things have to happen. Because then I know I've hit the really important stuff and and actually then it's easier to do the other stuff because I don't feel like I've got it weighing on my head. But I think, you know, most people with their list, everything's equal yep. or the easy stuff actually takes a higher priority. So they look at their list and they either start at the top and just head their way down and hope they get somewhere or they pick out all the easy stuff so they can cross it off. Yep. And then they're still left with the hard stuff that just goes on the next day's list. That's right. That's right. And another like way to think about or, or way to help solve some of that riddle is um, we, some researchers call it mental modeling, but um, when you, when you live in constant consumption, so we're listening to the radio on the way into work, podcast ears, you know, have a, ears on our podcast, by the way, which is an amazing resource to get, um, to get access to things that can make us better. But when we just yeah. live in constant consumption with no space, the biggest thing that we lose is, is the, the space required to think about what we want our day to look like. And, and by spending just a few minutes thinking, what do I have on my list? Um, what do I want to get done? Like, how's this day going to go? That's what we call mental modeling because it allows us to enter into work. And when we get off, we can more quickly see it. But when we don't already have a, a script that we're trying to move towards, then that, LinkedIn ping that someone asks us to be new, a new contact that then put us onto the main feed page that then sent us over to <laughs> send us somewhere else that eventually ends up with Star Trek reruns on YouTube. That's a lot easier to do when we don't have a script that we've already prepared on the way in for what we think the day should actually look like. Right. Right. Yeah. And then we're just bouncing from one thing to the next. And we get to the I end of the day. Really, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we don't even know what we did. Two thirds of people don't right. even know what they did, much less why they did it and wonder why we're emotionally disengaged and we hate our jobs. It's not because the work isn't good. It's because we haven't done, we haven't created the space that allows for emotional connection to it. Yeah. Yeah. That is so interesting. So this is a um, potentially uh, sort of, segueing off, but, but as we come close to wrapping this up, I'm always curious about this subject with people, and I don't think I ask it enough. Um, maybe it'll be on my goals for the next year, um, but I'll, so I'll start with you. Do you have a book that was influential for you on your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, there, well, several audio books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll give a few. One of my favorites that I recommend to people often is a book called Stumbling on Happiness by Harvard professor Dan Gilbert or Daniel Gilbert. And it's about the psychology of decisions and how we, you know, our aim is to be happy and we consistently make decisions that don't make us happy. And uh, it's, it's fascinating because it, it really does start to help us have a picture of where we have massive gaps in our our projected experience and our actual present experience. So that's a book that has really helped me to do a much better job of making better decisions in terms of the way that my work has grown simply because I'm aware of some traps that we can fall into. Ah, okay. That's interesting. I wrote that one down. Did you have others you said you were going, you wanted to? Yeah, you know, basic entrepreneurial, like the e-myth was a great one for me early on yeah. in my business that, you know, working on the business, not in the business was, was yeah. certainly, uh, certainly valuable. 
Um, I, you know, I, I like to consume. And honestly, the other thing I, I will say about books is that uh, I heard someone one time tell me, don't read a book that you aren't enjoying. And it was the most freeing thing I've ever had because I, I had probably stacks of hundreds of books that I had frit, read two or three chapters in and then given up on and felt guilty and then not read anything for a while because I felt like I was supposed to read this book that I didn't like. And uh -huh. uh, instead, I just, I read books I like. And, and yeah. I love, for instance, fantasy novels. I, my mind is always on work and fantasy novels are a wonderful way for me to get out of my own headspace and get sleep that I otherwise wouldn't have. And so I feel no guilt reading Game of Thrones. I feel no guilt reading some of those books and probably have helped me more with my business than anything else just by getting my mind off my business. That's a really great point. That's a great point. I don't think people realize, especially small business owners, I don't think they necessarily realize that unless they consciously put their mind someplace else, their mind is always on their work. Totally. And look, there's, there's, there is information out there that you don't have that is, is the reason you're not successful. <laughs> That's a, there's always something out there. And today it's never been easier to, to um, be reminded of the need for more consumption and more things we're supposed to know. The truth is that it's very seldom that we don't have the information at all. It's that we are stuck and paralyzed by um, how much has come at us and how little we processed. So yeah, if you don't read because no one reads anymore, then you probably do need to learn and it's really valuable to learn. But you know, turn off the audiobook for five minutes and think about how it actually matters to you and then flip over to something that allows you to re relax and rest and, and it's amazing how much these answers will solve themselves. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so um, I really appreciate that. And we have talked about a lot, so I, I'm going to challenge you. Um, what, if you could pick one piece of actionable advice that folks could go ahead and implement so they could start becoming more you know, focused and productive, what is one thing you think the listeners could do? Great question. Uh, you know, the truth is there's a lot of reasons we struggle to focus. And so the, but the very practical would be start your day by, as you're moving into the chapter of work, by closing the home chapter, thinking about what you want your day to look like, take five minutes at some point in the first hour of work to move from just the to-do list to actually asking what's important and allow your calendar and put those things into the calendar and allow your calendar and those priorities to drive and know the rest of it will get filled up anyways. Um, that's the short practical that I would offer. And then I would also just offer the bigger, um, the bigger and, and critical reminder for today, which is just to take your foot off your throat. Like it's, this is an impossible situation. You weren't supposed to, you were not supposed to have this much coming at you. Everyone has unreasonable expectations. You have available to you things your brain wasn't meant to resist. You are going to get distracted. Um, you are going to go to Amazon. You are going to miss deadlines. You're not going to reply to people. And, and it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We're all in it together. And um, guilt is a terrible long-term motivator. So let's just, let's just give it up and be okay with being distracted somewhere. <laughs> That's so great. That's like the perfect thing at the end of this because it's so liberating for people. We're being given permission that yeah. this is nuts, right? This is yeah. a crazy thing and let it go. That's really, that, that is awesome. So tell my listeners how they can get your book, how, you know, how they can connect with you, you know, whatever they should know. Please tell them. Yeah. Uh, well, the book is on Amazon. Well, it's really in any retail on Amazon. And uh, I will say if they, if they buy three, we do have a video course that they can go through as well. Uh, just shoot me an email. And my email is just Kurt, C-U-R-T at focuswise.com. Uh, I am accessible on Twitter and all of the social media. I'm, I'm not the best in terms of always, um, putting out and uh, I don't post as frequently as I'm supposed to, I suppose, but um, <laughs> email is probably the easiest route to get in touch with me uh, or okay. the website focuswise.com. And uh, you know, our organization is meant to be a resource for people who 
are struggling in a constantly connected workforce and would love to, uh, I, I'd love to help in any way I can. That's fabulous. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. That's totally my pleasure. Fabulous. And I always like to thank the listeners because you folks are why we are doing this thing, as well as our sponsor. Get a free trial and a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash business growth. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And I'm going to add in here, um, disconnect at least a couple of times um, in a day so that you can really reinvigorate and re-energize your life and your business. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. The Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Powder Donut. Okay, what's my line? Uh, The only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh, man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm going to need a few more minutes. Bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. The average person experiences up to 10,000 marketing efforts each day. Those ideas are called from millions of possibilities. The CMO Confidential Podcast takes you behind the scenes to learn about the decisions, drama, politics, and glory that go with one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite, the Chief Marketing Officer. Guests from all over the business world join Mike Linton, a five-time CMO, to share stories about what it's really like in the marketing universe.